Hey team, welcome. We're going to discuss traumatic brain injuries in this lecture, and certainly there's a lot to this concept, to the process of brain injuries, to the process of just normal brain physiology, and certainly that has an impact on our treatment. <clears throat> My goal here is to provide an overview of some of the key concepts associated with traumatic brain injuries for the paramedic. Our roadmap includes a brief review of anatomy and physiology, and some of that we'll be reviewing um, in the beginning. Others we'll be reviewing as we get further into the concepts and talk about specific injuries. We'll briefly review cerebral perfusion and intracranial pressure. We'll talk about common mechanisms of injury, the injuries that they produce, and to some degree, how assessment might identify those things. We'll talk about the categorization and pathophysiology of brain injury, specifically into primary and secondary brain injury types. And we'll finally talk about traumatic brain injury management at the paramedic level. Our resources for our discussion today include the PHTLS 9th edition and the AAOS Paramedic Textbook Emergency Care on the Streets 8th edition. Primarily, those concepts are covered in volume 2 of the two-volume set. <clears throat> Let's start with anatomy and physiology. So a question to get us started and to highlight that there is a direct relationship between understanding the anatomy of the systems that we review and being able to understand the pathophysiology that results from injuries and illness of that anatomy. So this is something that was covered in your EMT basic course, uh, though the wording might be a little bit different. Which type of cranial bleed listed below produces larger bleeding volumes in shorter time periods? So essentially, which bleeds faster and has quicker signs and symptoms of onset? Epidural bleeding or subdural bleeding? <clears throat> well, the answer is epidural bleeding. And we'll discuss why that is in just a moment, though you may have some relationship to it from the EMT basic curriculum. So let's dive in. Now, when we're looking at this diagram, we're really looking at a cross-section that shows how the structures get more complex and more susceptible to injury the deeper we go. And that's kind of true throughout the body. Think of where large blood vessels and bones are located in extremities. They're basically cushioned within some degree of soft tissue, muscle, maybe even a fat layer. Well, as we look at the transition from the outside world deep into the brain, the cranial vault, I want you to consider a few things. One, certainly we're going to look at the order of structures that are in that order from superficial to deep, but that's generally how the energy wave that would be associated with trauma, say blunt force trauma, somebody gets hit in the head with a baseball bat, that's how the energy wave is generally transmitted to the brain. It has to go through these uh, these superficial structures to get to the deep structures and there's energy waves that will make their way through largely unimpeded because there's a very thin soft tissue layer surrounding the bone of the cranium. Now certainly the scalp does provide some protection but much of the energy is still going to make its way into the the soft gelatinous form of the brain which is susceptible to that energy causing disruptions and causing bleeds from large and small blood vessels. So let's look at some of these structures as we go from superficial to deep. So right past the cranial bones, we have a layer of arteries that's sitting in the outside space, outside or superficial to the dura mater. The dura mater is the outermost layer of our meninges, making up the arachnoid space and arachnoid meninge, and the pia mater, which is essentially shrink wrap on the surface of the brain. Now, as we transition through these spaces, there's some hallmarks that we can use to kind of help us memorize some of the injuries that might be likely. Arteries tend to exist in the meningeal space outside of the dura mater. So that's technically the epidural space. And that was essentially our question, right? If we have bleeding that occurs rapidly in the presence of a, a traumatic brain injury, that bleeding may produce signs and symptoms that have a rapid onset. That's a hallmark of the epidural bleed or hematoma compared to the veins that are under deeper than the dura mater, the subdural space, which is primarily made of veins and a collection of cerebral spinal fluid. Now, the veins can certainly bleed, and they're large enough that they can bleed a lot, but they're under lower pressure, and so it takes a little bit longer in many cases for the blood vessels of the, the uh, subdural space to bleed volumes out. So signs and symptoms often are a little bit slower than we would find in our epidural. That's the subdural. Now, we don't stop necessarily here at the outer lining <clears throat> of, the, of the brain. Certainly, the brain has deep tissue that we're going to discuss. But the layers between the scalp and 
the cerebral the cerebrum of the brain are really pretty important and unfortunately commonly injured. In this picture, I'm highlighting something very specific that occurs in that space above the dura mater, outside of the dura mater, but inside the cranial bones. So this is a picture that shows the left and right side of the inside of a cranium. All the tissue has been removed, so we're really looking at the bone uh, and the remnants of the blood vessels that were there. Now, don't worry about all of the markings here. Just focus on the MMA. The MMA in both of these diagrams is an abbreviation of the middle meningeal artery. The middle meningeal artery is a large artery that basically is embedded inside the bone structure, and it travels right through the temple region. As a layperson, you might have heard that if a person has blunt force or penetrating trauma to the temple, it doesn't take a lot of energy to prove fatal results. And that's true. The reason that's true is because, as you can see, all of these grooves are where arteries were once embedded in the epidural space. The middle meningeal artery just happens to be large and passes right by an area, the temple, of the skull that's a little bit thinner than some of the other areas of the cranium. Injuries in the bone structure often do result in lacerations of the arteries that are embedded in them. And so it doesn't really take something like a large area like a depressed skull fracture with many bony fragments to cause large damage. In fact, we could have something that we can't really even identify easily in the field, a hairline fracture that just happens to cross over and cause bony fragments in the cranium right where these arteries are embedded. So that's a reason for us to have a lot of skepticism about patients <clears throat> after they've suffered head injuries, even if we don't see overt signs of trauma when inspecting them uh, outwardly. This picture highlights those blood vessels spreading throughout. This is on the inside of the cranium. Certainly there are arteries and veins that are embedded in the brain tissue itself, but again, we're talking about the superficial layer and we'll start moving inward. <clears throat> In this picture, I want you to just kind of imagine that um, this facial bone structure is missing and really just focus on the cranium. The bones of the cranium are somewhat, especially in the anterior portion of the cranium, are somewhat protected by the facial bones. The facial bones have many sutures and they have cavities that hold air pockets and mucus and those can be areas where energy might be dissipated if, say, somebody has a frontal impact impacting their face. The thought is that the facial bones can break and in doing so release some of the energy before it makes its way into the cranium. But right now we're not talking about the facial bones as a separate lecture. We're talking about the bones of the skull. So the nice convenient thing about the bones of the skull is that they're named in association with the underlying lobes on the brain cerebrum that are uh, just below them. So we have the frontal bone over the frontal lobe, parietal. Uh, we have one on each side, hemispherical the occipital bone, and the temporal as the major bones of our focus. Now, <clears throat> I want you to know these and know what each of those lobes of the brain does so that when we have a patient that has, say, a hematoma that's pronounced here in the occipit, you'll be able to deduce that if that's where the strike was for blunt force trauma, for example, then it's likely that the energy was also transmitted to the occipital region of the brain. The occipital region of the brain or the occipital lobe of the brain is where vision and uh, is processed. And so if we have a patient struck in the back of the head, a question we want to immediately ask is, is that area functioning normally? So we may assess the patient to see if they have any changes in their vision. If they don't have changes in their vision, that becomes one of our pertinent negatives. Right? We might expect that somebody that's hit in the back of the head where vision is processed might have some visual disturbances. And if they don't, it's relevant that we note that they don't because otherwise we would expect that they did, given our pertinent negatives. Now in this picture, uh, we're going to join this with another picture a little bit later associated with basilar skull fractures. But I wanted to highlight something that's going to be used pretty quickly as we pr progress through the injuries uh, of the brain. What we're looking at here is a top-down view. So we're looking from inferior to superior, and it's as if the top of the skull has been removed and certainly all the contents of the brain have been removed as well. So this is the base of the skull, where basilar skull fractures may occur. What we're seeing here are anterior, middle, and posterior fossa. And if we saw this from the side, we might see that these are actually at three different levels. <clears throat> 
This is the posterior. This is the anterior. And really, the fossa that it creates are little depressions, almost like little shelves or bowls. And those bowls can accumulate blood if bleeding has occurred in the brain. Now, from this top-down view, we can see that there's a few holes where if the brain was present, we would see things like cranial nerves exiting that space or some blood vessels exiting that space. And so those are occupied generally. However, there are openings in which if blood is pooling in these areas, blood can leak out into the soft tissue nearby. It gives rise to things like battle signs and raccoon's eyes in patients that have um, usually progressed signs and symptoms of basilar skull fractures. Look at this big old hole here, though. The foramen magnum is the largest opening. It's in the base of the skull and usually is occupied by the brainstem as it exits the cranium and turns into the spinal column. Now, this is important because if the cranium is injured and stuff is accumulating, blood is accumulating inside the cranium, it's putting pressure on the brain, it's putting pressure on all the structures, and especially if we have a closed head injury. Well, that pressure accumulation is eventually need to, need to go somewhere. And often it's the path of least resistance, which is often the largest hole that's open in the cavity. Now, again, this is occupied by the brainstem. So the brain's not going to leave the uh, cranium through the foramen magnum, but it's going to try. And that will put pressure wherever we have bleeding, often downward onto the brainstem. And that gives rise to the unusual signs and symptoms that we see in brain injuries. This picture here shows the lobes of the cerebrum, the higher level process of the human brain. And so this is a complex area, but we can get some basic understandings for individual regions. Certainly you've explored more of this in your neurology class uh, than we'll be exploring here today. So couple your understanding of neurology in the different regions of the brain and their roles. Then to say, I expect these things to be impacted if these areas are impacted by trauma. The frontal lobe is responsible for things like personality. Also, we can find inhibition comes from this area. Why is that important? Well, if somebody's struck in the forehead and it causes damage to the frontal lobe, that person might not inhibit the unusual and, although we all experience them, potentially problematic and violent tendencies that we have in response with anger. So let's not sugarcoat it. If we're driving in Albuquerque and someone cuts us off, we get mad. And sometimes we get really mad. We might, if not for inhibition, follow that person or try to engage in a fight, tailgate, or brake check them. But if we do that in Albuquerque, you're likely to get shot or a kid in the car is likely to get shot. So our inhibition gets the better of us and allows us to then calm ourselves down and brings us back to reality where we're probably just going to let that go and might have saved somebody's life in the process. Well, patients that have an injury to the frontal lobe may not be able to inhibit their reactions. And so they may be more violent or their behavior may be more aggressive than normal. And so again, gives us rise to some of the signs and symptoms that we may expect if there's an injury to that region. The central sulculus separates the uh, frontal lobe and the parietal lobe. And along that deep groove, we find a split between motor and sensory tasked neurons. The parietal lobe and portions of the frontal lobe are so interesting. One of the things that I got when I took a, a, a biological psychology class was that we've already mapped out areas of the brain, specifically the parietal lobe, in which we have a map of the human body on the brain, meaning we know where this point in the brain may communicate with the body if it's sensory or if it's motor. And so we can kind of pinpoint where these things are coming from. So if somebody has, say, a very localized seizure activity to one region of their body, it may be indicating that specific region of the brain giving rise to those abnormal responses. We've discussed a little bit about the occipital lobe, though not part of the cerebrum. The cerebellum sits right below and is attached to our brainstem, which we'll see in just a moment. The temporal lobe is helpful in processing auditory, uh, processing sound that's coming through our ears and also with memory. However, there's also that tie to our inner ear that gives rise to coordination and balance being part of our temporal lobe. Now, the brainstem actually has three different levels, and in both of the pictures I've chosen to show you, they don't show the, the topmost level, the midbrain. But it's buried. The midbrain is in the middle of the brain, buried in the center, below all of these other structures, and at the top of the brainstem. We'll talk about the pons medulla and the uh, midbrain in just a moment. So again, I don't show in this diagram the midbrain, which would be sitting right on top of our brainstem. 
I'm not going to talk a lot about the details in this because when we get to the section on herniation from traumatic brain injuries, the impact on the brainstem gives rise to the vital signs that we see in patients with well-progressed and increasing intracranial pressure. But the broad strokes we can get from this area here. The midbrain is a coordination point between our cerebrum and the exit point through our brainstem into our spinal column, both for sensory and motor, but especially motor control. In addition, the midbrain is associated with the reticular activating system, which is responsible for our sleep-wake cycle. It helps not just our wakefulness, but it can also help direct our attention. And so injuries to the midbrain may result in changes in LOC and behavior in patients. Just below the <clears throat> midbrain is the pons. Now I'm going to take here in this picture the pons and the mandula kind of together. The combination of the pons and the mandula gives rise to our vital signs, both our voluntary and involuntary vital signs. Pons is more responsible for our involuntary vital sign of controlling respiration with conscious thought than the medulla is responsible for voluntary. Medulla oblongata has our vital centers in it, and so we'll find cardiovascular centers controlling both heart rate, rate uh, strength of contraction, and blood vessel constriction and dilation to impact blood pressure. But it also has a role in ventilation as well. 